What I will do is, in the next half hour, is give a short uh, introduction to MEG analysis using the field trip toolbox. Um, uh, contrary to Alex's uh, presentation, uh, <coughs> we, we don't have the laptops here yet, so I'm not going to show anything hands-on. I'm just going to show how you would interact with it or how you're going to interact with it in, in the hands-on section. Um, in, in the hands-on section, very similar to, to Alex's uh, m and hands-on, I've prepared a, like an HTML page, like a, a web page, on the, on the basis of which we're going to copy and paste uh, things from the web page into MATLAB and work our way through uh, a couple of exercises. Uh, but prior to that, I want to explain like what FieldTube is about. Um, and that helps if I put this one in. So, um, FieldTube is a, a MATLAB toolbox. Um, for the analysis of uh, electrophysiological data. We use it for EEG data, MEG data, animal recording data, but in principle it can be used on any sort of time series data. Uh, it can import data from many different file formats, so it's not a pure MEG toolbox. It's, it's used a lot for EEG as well. Um, and it contains algorithms for spectral analysis, source analysis, uh, statistical analysis, uh, connectivity measures, basically all the things that we consider necessary for doing our own research in Nijmegen. Uh, we've implemented them in the field trip toolbox and made them available to the community. Um, and the outline of the talk is that I'll very shortly touch upon the type of signals that are generated in the brain. Of course, that has been explained by Mati, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat that. I just want to stress those aspects which are relevant in the analysis. Subsequently, I will tell uh, how we analyze those signals in field trip, and at the end I will like use a f like two or three slides on, on the background of the field trip project so that you have a little bit of an idea of how, how the whole thing is, is organized. But first, what kind of signals are generated in the brain? Well, uh, as Mati explained, we record the, we measure the field that is associated with the postsynaptic potentials, excitatory and inhibitory, um, in the pyramidal neurons. And the pyramidal neurons are perpendicular to the cortical sheet, and if that's sufficiently superficial, we record that with the MEG. Um, yeah, so it's excitatory and inhibitory input. Uh, and usually we study this uh, following an event, following a stimulus or following an intrinsic event like a movement. Um, and a lot of the example material that we have in this workshop pertains to like either sensory or cognitive manipulations. Uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot use the same methods on clinical data, because in clinical data you often do not have those external manipulations to your subject. You have internal things happening, seizures for example. Uh, but a lot of the analysis strategies can be used the same for clinical data as on um, cognitive data. The, the big difference is that in cognitive data we spend a lot of time designing the experiment, uh, which means also we also spend a lot of time deciding how to segment the data. Whereas in clinical data we often segment it into, for, say, for example, one second pieces and just process all those one second pieces because there's not no specific temporal structure in it. Um, we have the cortex. If we zoom in on the cortex, we have the, the cortical sheet. Tangential dipoles uh, produce a magnetic field that can be picked up on the outside. Um, radial dipoles produce no external magnetic field. Uh, so we're <coughs> this is, these are the, the ones that we're mainly sensitive for. And um, here you see how a dipole with currents inside the volume conductor of the head is producing magnetic fields and it is really helpful if you remember the right hand rule so that if you see a pattern that you think well how, how would I explain that pattern with my right hand so if the current is running in this direction this is how the field is curving around it, it helps a lot in interpreting these sculpt topographies with EG volume conduction make sure that we can pick up the signal at the scalp so the current is produced by the EG uh, is conducted through the conductive tissues, uh, brain tissue, skull, scalp, uh, and we, we can record the, the consequences of that current uh, as potential differences at the electrodes. With MEG, we record the magnetic fields, um, and as you see here, <coughs> we have sensors that are above the head, not directly attached to the head. Uh, the, these sensors are actual gradiometers. The system here in uh, NADMEC has planar gradiometers. Um, but ba and basically, they, they pick up the magnetic field. Um, this is the spatial aspect. Um, the main reason for doing images is that we're interested in a temporal aspect. 
So if we think about brain activity following ev an event, for example a stimulus, where we think of that the brain becomes active, that some activity shows. And if we repeat the same event many, many times, we can average all those occurrences, all those trials, and we get the event-related field. Um, the averaging helps to remove noise. So even if I add noise, the averaging ensures that the signal becomes visible. And, and still here, the, um, the signal is already visible in a single trial, whereas typically the noise is so large that you, you won't, will not be able to see activity in a single trial. However, there's also cases where uh, the event is inducing activity, which is not phase-locked to the event. So what you see here is activity that is time-locked. So following the event, there is cortical activity. But in some cases, the cortical activity starts with an upward deflection, and in some cases, it starts with a downward deflection. If we average this type of activity, we're not going to see anything in the event-related field. So that's why we need different analysis strategies for this, which we, we, which we, we will touch upon tomorrow. Um, if, we cons if we look at the characteristics of the MEG data, then we can look at the time cost of activity, for example, with, with event-related potentials or fields, at the spectral characteristics using the power spectrum, fast Fourier transforms. We can look at the temporal changes in the power spectrum with wavelet techniques, but we can also look at spatial distribution of, of the activity over the head. Um, these all have to do with the time series and these have to do with the spatial characteristics. A lot of the analysis strategies are focused either on one or on the other. But it is very important to realize that if we have a source somewhere in the brain, then that source has a certain time course associated with it, um, and another source might have another time course associated with it. So if you now look at a channel that's more or less in between, the channel is going to see both sources. So spatially, both, both sources project onto this channel, and the time course of the channel is going to reflect both sources. Channels that are close to this source will mainly show this activity, and vice versa uh, here. So the consequence of, for the data is that the data is an overlap, is a superposition of the time series of the different sources. So EG and MEG data also ha has to be always has to be considered as a spatial temporal representation of all the activity. Sometimes we focus on space, sometimes we focus on time, but you always have to keep in mind that both aspects relate to how the data was generated and how the data should be analyzed. So, a very important challenge if you start analyzing EG and MEG data is in separating those sources. If you're only interested in space, then fMRI is probably the better technique, but if you're interested in time series, then you want to have individual estimates of the underlying sources, not of the channels, but of the sources. So what you want to do is you want to separate the time series of the sources. And for that it helps to also separate them spatially. So we can use the temporal aspects of the data to look at the at, the, at separating. So we can look at different event-related field latencies. We can look at different waves. S since the data is a linear superposition, if I have two conditions, condition A and condition B, if I subtract the two conditions, the ERPs of the two conditions, what I'm going to see is a difference wave. And the difference wave corresponds to those brain regions that are differentially activated in the two conditions. So that's a, ver that's a very powerful technique. Of course, we can also use like filters for the time series to focus on lower frequency activity, higher frequency activity. If you're interested in gamma band activity, then you can also apply a low pass, uh, like a high pass filter and ignore all the low frequency content. And of course, you can use spectral decomposition, which is more appropriate for frequency analysis. For zooming in on the spatial aspects of the data, we would start with making a volume conduction model of the head. That's what we're going to do on Thursday morning. Um, and then we estimate the source model properties. So both these and these analysis methods are implemented in the toolbox. And you often have to use them in conjunction. OK, on to uh, how to analyze the, the signals with field trip. As I've said, a field trip is a, is a toolbox. Uh, it consists of tools, and it doesn't have a graphical user interface. The idea is that you pick the tools and you build something out of them. Uh, the thing that you build is an analysis script or an analysis protocol. Um, and that means that you have to like, get to know the tools and you have to get to know how to, how to put them together, how to combine them into something, like into a nice building. Um, field trip functions follow a, 
uh, standardized interface. So we have functions. A function model also always has a name. Uh, and the first input argument is always the configuration structure. The configuration structure tells the function how it should behave. So it, it has the details to the algorithm. And then subsequently it has one or multiple input data arguments and it has one, one or multiple output data arguments. Some functions do not produce output data, such as the plotting functions. They produce a figure, but no data. Uh, some functions do not take input data, such as the preprocessing function. It, it reads from disk, it doesn't read from memory. Um, the configuration argument, which, which is uh, identical in all the functions, although not shared, like every function has its own configuration structure. That's a standard MATLAB structure. And what we try to do is make it as human readable as possible. So we give it fields that mean something and we try to use also values for those fields that are meaningful. So we, we use channel names, not channel numbers. We use frequency, frequency of interest limits that are expressed in Hertz, not in frequency bins. We use time in seconds, uh, not, in, uh, not in samples. So in wherever possible, we try to use meaningful names in the configuration structure. The relevance of that is that if you compare FieldTube to default MATLAB, then what we have is key value pairs, where you specify for each key what value it should take. The more complex MATLAB functions, for example, the plotting functions have this a lot, they allow you to specify key value pairs in a command line. If you write it like this, you get a, a, tech, you, you get a script which reads like an, a narrative story. Uh, you specify how the function behaves, then you call the function. You specify how the function behaves, you call the function. Uh, if you specify it like this, you get very long lines, which would have to wrap. If you want to disable one of the lines, it's very difficult because you have to delete it. So in scripts, this is much more readable than this. And that's important because the script is the thing that you're building the analysis with. So making sure that the script is clear, clearly readable is important because that helps understanding the analysis. So what we do is we take those functions and we put them in a, an analysis pipeline or analysis protocol. So we would start with FT preprocessing. Um, FT preprocessing, this is the help of the function. It can be used to read the data according to the configuration. It can also be used to preprocess data that's already in memory. So what we would do is we would call the function with such a configuration would specify the data set, we would specify filter settings, then we would call the function. Uh, and then we would do frequent frequency analysis, where we would specify that we want to use multi-tape or fast free transform, specify the frequency of interest limits, and then we would call the function. So that's basically how you build such a script. Um, so the functions are one thing, the other thing are the data structures. This is an example of a raw data structure. Um, it's Again, it's a standard MATLAB structure. FieldTrip has a has a relatively limited number of data structures. So there's maybe five or six or so which are, which are important. This is for raw data. The most important field is the trial field. What you can see is that this data structure has 87 trials. Each trial is represented as a matrix, and the matrix is channels by time points. We could have chosen to represent this in a three-dimensional array. However, if we represent it in a three-dimensional array, then the requirement is that all the trials have to be of equal length. And that is a requirement that we often cannot fulfill with our experimental designs. And that's, that is something that will be shown tomorrow morning when we do the frequency analysis. We'll have an experimental design where trials have a variable length because the subject's Q comes at a random moment in time. Every trial is a matrix and every trial has a vector describing the time axis of the trial. Every tri so in the, all the trials share the same uh, labels, share the same channels. Um, and, there's some, and there's some additional information such as sampling frequency, header information from the file from which it was read and the, and the configuration. This is an example of an event-related field. So what you see is that there's an average which is 151 by 900. So that's a matrix. Uh, and you can directly like, plot it in MATLAB without using any other functionality. What you also see is that there's labels, 151 strings, and there's a time axis, 900. Also important is this dim ord. So the more complex field trip data structures all have a dim ord, and the dim ord specifies how you can interpret the data. So here the data is still relatively straightforward with uh, channels by time. And if I look at the dim ord, I know it's channels by time, 
channels, what is 151 times 900, so anything that is 151 by 900, which also includes the variance, can, can be interpreted as channels by time. If you go to frequency analysis, and if you keep trials, then you can have up to four-dimensional structures. If you go to source space, you can have up to five-dimensional structures. Three dimensions for space, and then time and frequency. So that's why it's important to keep track of all these, all these dimensions. And again, it has this uh, configuration structure. Keeping track of your analysis is, of course, important. You spend a lot of time doing the analysis, uh, and you write scripts, but scripts might change over time, and that's why Fieldtrip keeps track of it. You specify the input configuration to each of the functions. The output configuration is present in each of the data structures. So if you look at such a function call, then data out is the data structure with, with, with of course, the results of the computation, but it also has the configuration, and this configuration is the one that you specified here, including the parameters that you've chosen, but also including the parameters that are the defaults of this function. So that means that if you want to really know what the function has been doing, you look in the output configuration for, for, the, for the details. Furthermore, each of these input arguments has its own configuration. Those are also kept with the data. So data out.cfd.previous contains, the the, co contains the details on the previous computational steps. So that means that the details of the computations are kept with the data. The data itself is not kept, at least not by field trip. If you want, you can keep all the data on disk, but at a certain point you might have so many data that you have to weed out. If at the end of the analysis, if you have a figure, then in that figure you still have all the details of how all the steps that were taken and how you can reconstruct the figure. That means that you, you can actually check prior to putting the figure in your publication whether you're really looking at the appropriate piece of data that has, has been process such as you've described in your method section. Um, yeah, so previous data is not kept, but it can be reconstructed. Okay, so what we do is we, we start with writing a script. Uh, very often we would start with a, with a pilot recording on a pilot subject, and we start analyzing. So we would start with pre-processing, frequency analysis, and then frequency statistics, and then we would continue with plotting or some other analysis pipeline. And once you're happy with the results that you're getting for a single subject, well, what it very easily allows you f for you to do is to put it in a for loop. So what you can do is you can specify all the subjects, you can specify the trigger codes that you want to analyze, and for each of the subjects, for each of the conditions, you call FT preprocessing and FT frac analysis. This is something that you would start in the evening, and then the next morning you would find that your computer ran out of memory, probably. Because what I'm doing here, I'm storing everything in the cell array, and especially with MEG data, this, this is large. Um, so that means that it just doesn't fit, all of these data sets doesn't fit, don't fit in memory. So what we typically do is we would do something like this. So we would write the data to disk and then continue with the next subject. And this would run through the night and then the next morning you would find all the files nicely on your hard disk. Oops. Um, if you have access to big computers, like to massive multi-core computers, perhaps even to a Linux cluster, then you can also use FieldTube for parallel processing. The MATLAB distributed computing toolbox has the dfeval function. FieldTube has a similar function which is called qsubcellfun, and it allows you to run FieldTube analysis on a, on a Torque or a grid engine cluster. The strategy to use for that is that rather than doing all the computations in the, in the for loop, I'm only specifying the configuration. What I'm specifying here is that the configuration for step A writes its data in output file, and the configuration for step B reads its data from the input file. So th this is basically links them together. Like this is for big computation, so you, you cannot have all this data in memory anyway, so the data has to go to disk, and we're now using the disk to pass information from one step to the other step. After having specified all of this, which doesn't take much time, I would evaluate FT preprocessing in parallel on all of my subjects and all my conditions, which would basically fire off the jobs on the compute cluster, then I would do the same for frac analysis. This is, this, this is useful, especially if you have large data sets, because it really speeds up processing, uh, and it makes it possible to explore a much wider range of parameters in the analysis. So FieldTube is a toolbox. Uh, uh, it has tools. You take the tools and you build something out of it. So the, this, the functions are in your hands, and uh, 
the style and the uh, way that you that that you sculpt your scripts that depends on your programming style. It depends on your preferences. Um, it also depends on the features of the data. For EEG data, like 32 channel EEG data sampled at 250 hertz, those are small data sets. You can much, much more easily keep them in memory than uh, 300 channel MEG data sets that are sampled at 1000 hertz. Uh, so those, do, th those features do affect the, uh, the style of the scripts. Um, important is to realize that scripts correspond to analysis protocols. So at the end of your analysis, you have a bunch of figures and you have your script. And what you can do is you can talk with your supervisor or you can talk with your student. You can check what your student has been doing or you can check with your colleagues what they have been doing or whether they agree to your style. So you can share your script, you can have them reviewed uh, and they, they provide a lot of information about the results. Um, and scripts are often shared with, with colleagues. So we have certain scripts like floating around at the Donner Center which have been there for like almost 10 years. And, then, and nowadays they look completely different than when we started but still they like they're inherited from one generation of students to the next generation of students the general concept of field trips that we try to provide a one to one mapping between conceptual steps in the analysis and field trip toolbox functions so we start with selecting pieces of data uh, detect and remove artifacts and we filter we average and then we compute variance and we use statistical comparison all of those steps are implemented in individual field trip functions and the nice thing is that you can combine these filter functions in many different ways. So this is an overview of uh, the filter functions, like of the main filter functions. But this is an overview that I made in 2007. Uh, by now we have many more filter functions, like slightly more than 100, 100 functions. And you can combine them in many different ways. That gives a lot of flexibility. But of course it also begs the question, like how do you keep an overview of all these functions that you have? Um, for that we provide... Uh, like documentation, of course. So finding a way around it in the field toolbox is, is like a, a very important aspect. Well, first of all, you can just use the built-in MATLAB functionality. You can type help function name. It will give you an, an informative section on how the function is to be used. And in every function, we provide pointers to other functions that are related to it. Um, also important is that you can edit functions. Like it's open source, so all the code is there. So if the help doesn't specify what a function is doing to the level of detail that you want to know it, just look in the code. Um, we have a website, so this is the official address. This is where it's currently hosted. Um, the FieldTube website is a wiki. That means that it's very easy for people to contribute to it. And it has a, a, a quite an elaborate collection of tutorials. For this workshop, we decided to work on data that was recorded here. Um, because in Nijmegen we have a CTF scanner and the channel design of the CTF scanner is quite different than the channel design of the Neuromax scanner. So it makes more, much more sense to work on, on, the, on, the, on the Neuromax scanner here. On, on, the, on the website you will find also a lot of examples that show how to work with EEG data or with CTF MEG data or even with spike and, and LFP data. Um, there's also example scripts that frequently ask questions, so this like this really a useful resource. Um, we have an email discussion list uh, with a lot of knowledgeable people uh, answering to questions of people that start with new analysis, and this is really a, a great resource, like the, the joint knowledge of people that are working with it. Um, also, an important one is the expertise that you build up in your local group. Like FieldTube is really a joint project. We work not only in Nijmegen but with, with colleagues all over the world in developing this toolbox. But sharing expertise is very important. And that is also one of the goals of this, of this workshop is not only to give you the expertise, but also to build this network of people within Sweden and in, within Scandinavia with expertise in, 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 in a more advanced analysis. So it's also important that you realize like, who is close by that might be able to help you. Um, asking a question to someone on your floor or in your, maybe even in your office will be much faster then sending an email off to a field discussion list. Because the, the person in your office knows what kind of problems you're working with. He knows your background, he knows your um, analytical skills, and he probably will be able to provide a much more to the point answer than someone who doesn't know you. So, th so this, is, this is important. So and that's also something that you should foster. Like you should try to share your knowledge, like use the knowledge of, of people around you, but also share your knowledge with other people. Okay. 
very shortly on the, on the background of the, of the field trip toolbox. So the audience for whom we're developing the toolbox is experimental neuroscientists. But field trip doesn't have a graphical user interface. Uh, we are not targeting all the experimental neuroscientists. We have certain ambitions at the Donner Center. Um, and we expect people that are using field trip also to be ambitious and to have the um, the willingness to invest time in getting to know the toolbox. Uh, once you get to know the toolbox, it's a very flexible and very powerful tool. Uh, but there are easier tools, also more limited tools, but there are, there are easier tools. So maybe FieldTrip is not the most appropriate tool for you. Um, another group of people that we target as an audience is developers of other software packages. We have a lot of active collaborations with, for example, SPM, but also with EEG Lab with BESA, which is a company, but still we can work together with them quite well. Um, BCI 2000, Symbio, OpenMEG. We have a lot of exchange of code between these packages and ex exchange of expertise. The idea of targeting developers of other software packages is that we make the methods that are developed by them available to the experimental neuroscientists. So the way that you can think of FieldTrip is that it's a platform for sharing expertise between not only experimental neuro neuroscientists among themselves, but also between methods people and experimental neuroscientists. And that's also a two-way change of expertise. So they're not only methods people that give something, but it's also the experimental neuroscientists that give something to the methods people. Namely, like feedback on, whether meth on which methods work and which methods do not work on real data, and not, not only on simulated data. And in general, we, we target developers of analysis methods just to like, integrate and further grow the uh, available uh, analysis methods. If you look at the, at the toolbox at a glance, then this is where most of you will be. Like at, at the top level, looking down at the toolbox, so you see main functions, you see private functions. Or oh, actually, you don't see the private functions. But if you look at in detail at the private functions, then those are organized in, like in sub-toolboxes, like mini toolboxes. And each of these is a directory in the field trip main tree. Um, this is where you have the functions that you normally would be interacting with. They're all prefixed with ft underscore something. And th these functions all take a CFG as their first input argument. The low level functions, they do actually the hard work. So th these functions do not take a CFG as input argument, but they, they, these work with matrices uh, and with vectors and with numbers. These, these take care of the data handling, bookkeeping, mapping channel numbers onto channel names, Mapping, mapping frequency in hertz onto frequency bins in a matrix, and these do the actual computations. If, if you look in slightly more detail even, there's one level underneath. And that's really the, really the private functions where all the gory details are implemented. Those are typically the functions that you should not be using. The functions at this level are occasionally useful, and we'll, in the next hands-on we'll also use some of these functions to look in detail at the event structure and at the, at the data. Um, so that was basically like the, the short introduction and what we're going to do in the hands-on session is that we